Ben. Uh, Hulu. But it's only on Crunchyroll, Hulu, or any of them. I think even Netflix. But yeah. it used to be like the way that we were talking like middle school. It was it was happening while another was happening while another was happening. Uh, so they got to a point that it just stopped. And now like years later, they finally started it up again, which is pretty exciting. Always a lovely way to start, especially on a nice sunny day at altitude. It's really nice out right now. It's very fair. Yes, you guys are you guys are you're feeling very springy. I can tell you guys are like uh, yeah, you're all frisky and spring spunky. Yep. But it's gonna get horrible again, like tomorrow. Yep, we'll get all good and depressed tomorrow. And then it'll melt off within a day and we'll all be right back where we started. Okay, let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. So this is where we left off, right? So we're talking about the uh, skin cancer, right? We're gonna be taking a look at, uh, I think we've ended off our conversation. We we're talking about moles and freckles and all sorts of cool little things. Um, blemishes perhaps, or beauty marks, depends on who you are. Right, um, one person's blemish is another beauty mark. Right, that kind of idea. So then, uh, let's take a look at cancer, right? Because we talked a little bit about the, um, like the basal cell carcinomas, right? We talked a, bit, a little bit about sarcomas. We talked a little bit about that in the previous chapter. Of course, now the big M, right? Melanoma. And uh, we were kind of talking a little bit also because when we took a look at this picture. A lot of you guys are probably looking at this, thinking like, "Oh, wait a minute, crap." Um, this uh, looked kind of mole-like to me, right? And uh, if you're kind of uh, beholden to moles, then you're kind of starting to sweat, sweat a little bit. And that's where I left you. Yep. Is that lovely of me? Is that sweet of me? Or I just kind of leave you hanging like that? <laughs> right? Which, by the way, is always a good thing. Uh, you know, especially in this kind of an environment. Okay, so how do we know that this isn't a mole? Well, there's a couple of things, a couple of criteria that you always want to check down. Oftentimes what happens is patients often will look at one, but not all, right? So you want a few of these to apply before you start falling apart. Uh, and we'll take a look at this really good example of one, right? So the ABPD rule uh, for checking on melanoma. The first one is a symmetry. What does that mean? That means that typically speaking, generally, not always, but generally, moles will usually be well bounded. And they'll be, for the most part, concentric in nature, right? And that's by and far. Now, does every mole look like that? No, right? I think, uh, uh, Luke, you mentioned birthmarks. Birthmarks are abnormal. I mean, they're irregular in shape, right? Some moles can also be irregular in shape as well. So just because you're asymmetrical doesn't necessarily mean it's time to fall apart. Now, um, the other one is when you take a look at asymmetry, you can see there's asymmetrical in all sorts of ways, not just in shape, but also in coloration, all sorts of things. There's a lot of just general asymmetry with it. Moles tend to be fairly uniform for the most part, okay? And the other big one is the border. This is also a very common thing to use, right? Because remember, these are cellular processes. Remember, when you're looking at cancer, for cancer, it basically starts when one cell goes rogue, but the descendants of that cell are also rogue, which means everybody is basically doing their own thing. And they're all playing different songs. Some of those songs sound great. Some of those sound, songs sound very terrible. But when you have a whole room of cells doing this different thing, you're going to have a lot of just uni kind of unique differences between the different cell populations. But even though they're all cancer cells, they're all going to do different things because they're all basically kind of going in different pathways. Okay, so they're not carbon copies of each other the way that it's supposed to be when cell division is working, right? Cell division, your cell, your cell daughter cells are not supposed to have all these massive differences. They're supposed to be essentially be the same thing, right? You can think of the cells in cancer in a lot of ways, you can think of cancer in general as sort of like high-speed evolution, right? So where instead of you having a mutation every million years, 
Here you're having massive amounts of mutation every cellular generation. So the mutation rate is higher, but this shows you what can happen when you have a high mutation rate. So everybody's going off in their own direction. Why? Because the mutations that I experience as a cell are gonna be different than the mutations that Luke experiences as a cell. So we could both be cancer cells sitting right next to each other. But when I go through cell division, the types of damage and mutations that I accumulate are random. And so I will accumulate a different spectrum of mutations than Luke. And so we could be right next to each other, but our descendants could start to look very different from each other, even though we're right next to each other. So that idea of asymmetry and dissimilarity is because of the cellular nature, the fact that we're just off into two different directions, okay? So border irregularity is part of this. So you'll see, you notice the kind of ruffling effect. That is where you want to sort of be a little on the concern side. So notice you see a lot of very fine ruffling. Now, what is that telling you? What that's telling you is that there's cell division going on in this direction and in this direction, but not so much in this area right here. That is showing you an asymmetry in the amount of cell division. Remember, even though moles are kind of asymmetrical in the sense that they have abnormal amounts of melanin accumulation, they're still symmetrical overall because they're producing the same high amount of melanin across the entire mole tissue, which is the reason why moles tend to be fairly continuous for the most part. But when you see that ruffling, that's a little concerning. The other big one, and this is a big one, is color. If you see a lot of splotchiness in it, um, redness, for instance, not just your regular melanin pigment, but redness as well, this is concerning. So for instance, you'll see that over here, you see a really big dark blob that, and it's right next to a very lightly pigmented blob and then something sort of in between, but you can even see variances within this. So what you're looking at here, none of that, but you can see like little focal points of darkness in the midst of otherwise lighter colored tissue. So what that's telling you is that these are individual cell populations that are basically doing their own thing. And they're all rogue. They're all just scattering in all these million different directions. And that's what's creating this color difference differential. And so that's a really big tip off. The other one is diameter. So typically, if it's greater than six millimeters, usually you might want to have a dermatologist check that out. But it's not just six millimeters, because if it is melanoma, it's six millimeters and growing to seven to eight. Okay. And so that's, uh, that's in a common thing. And that's where you get to this last one, which is really key. That is, it has to be evolving and changing. So if you see a concerning spot like this and you're wondering about it, it's like, well, it's a little asymmetrical. It's got some irregularity to it. It's not a nice tight little circle. So what is this, right? Is this like a melanoma? Well, keep an eye on it, right? Do your ABCD rule check down, check measures, check for irregularities, right? Is it changing over time? Is it getting color variation over time? Is it, um, um, you, is it getting more ruffly, like a cloud, billowing kind of a situation? If the answer is yes to any of those, then you probably want to have a dermatologist check that one out, okay? Now, are all the other big one is also, and it's not always the case, but a lot, sometimes uh, some people will be like, well, if it's raised or if it's flat, that's a concern one way or the other. Uh, well, not really, right? Because moles, although generally are raised, they're not all raised. Right? There are some flat looking moles that look very similar to this. But when you go through your ABCD check down, you realize number one is they're not changing, right? So may, even if they're like at the six millimeter mark, because the six millimeter mark, generally speaking, you're kind of like, well, it's kind of a biggish side mole, but those aren't necessarily, you know, panic button time, right? What you do is you measure it and you keep track of it. Because if it is melanoma, it's not going to stay at six millimeters for long. By the way, that doesn't necessarily mean if it's smaller than six millimeters that you're off the hook, right? Because if it's like three millimeters and it's moving up to three and a half to four, guess what? 
that fits criteria E. It's evolving and changing. Moles don't change, right? They're laid down in embryology. They are what they are. You've got them for good or for bad. They're there for you for your rest of your life, unless you take them off, right? So the idea here is abnormality, right? Asymmetry and constant change. If it's changing, then that's a problem. But here's the problem with this, right? So mole uh, check downs are easy enough if you can find them. One of the uh, un most unfortunate things is even when you do like a check down, like a dermatology check down, the dermatologist is only gonna be able to check what's exposed. There are, and uh, there are many cases of melanoma cropping up in people because they were in areas where you just, you couldn't see it, okay? Um, like under your hair, usually the dermatologist would check your scalp for the most part, but there's some areas where it's just like, yeah, it's just, it was in an area like in your ear or something like that. And you just, you missed it because it was easy to miss and you just couldn't find it. And those come to get you, right? And those, so there's a lot of melanoma cases that are like that. Okay, so that's all associated with your epidermis. Now let's take a look at our dermis, right? So our dermis is pretty cool because this is where all your connective tissue is, right? This is where all the good stuff is happening. So not only do you have your connective tissue matrix in your dermis, but this is where you actually have all the cool stuff. So you have uh, your collagen laid down in there, right? Because you're laying down connective tissue. You have your elastic um, proteins, elastin, and your reticular fibers laid down in there because you're laying down connective tissue. But your cells that are laying down connective tissue are your fibroblasts. Your fibroblasts are massively active in your dermis constantly. And no, not that, but it's also because, I mean, of all the areas that you injure the most in your body, your dermis is probably the one that takes the most punishment. I mean, think about how many times you've cut yourself. Probably too many to count, right? That's your dermis. You're just basically throttling on your dermis. And so, that's where your fibroblasts have to come in and sort of lay it all down again to sort of make sure it's like, oh, I see you just pretty well trashed your dermis there. Okay, I got to need some more connective tissue to make sure that you don't come apart at the seams, like literally come apart at the seams, right? So they're heavily active in there. And guess who to clean up all the mess when you do damage your connective tissue? Back pages. So these guys clean up debris in connective tissue during injury and they fight bad guys. So they're kind of like a little all purpose. Basically they kill stuff and they'll kill stuff indiscriminately, um, whatever you want to be killed. And then the nice thing about macrophages and the reason why I like this is we usually associate, especially when you get an AMP2, you start to associate macrophages with sort of your defense system and you start to closely align them with your immune system. And it's very easy to forget their non-immune system role, which is as the cleanup division, right? So when you've got all this bomb debris all over the place because you just cut yourself, somebody's got to come in there and clean up all those shards of connective tissue laying all over the place. And that's the macrophages who do that. When you rupture an arterial and you bleed in your connective tissue, you got all these red blood cells all over the place. Somebody's got to come in there and clean those up, right? So when you get all that pooling blood in your dermal connective tissue, we, we refer to that as what? It's a bruise, right? And then who comes in and cleans up that mess? Your macrophages, okay? That's the reason why, and actually there's a, there's a stepwise process to that cleanup that involves blood cell breakdown and, and hemoglobin breakdown, which is the reason why your bruises change color. Um, it's associated with the breakdown products of blood, but your macrophages are doing all that. Okay, so they got to clean up all that mess and your fibroblasts have to basically lay it all down again. And that's pretty much typical. And then of course, you'll have some adipocytes, adipocytes. Um, so those are the fat cells basically. It's a high pollutant, important term for fat cell basically, adipocytes. Now, what else is in the dermis? Well, there's a lot of cool stuff in the dermis, right? So we already talked about blood vessels. There's arterioles in there. This is where your hair follicles will originate. This is where your smooth muscles are. For instance, your erector pilus muscle, um, which they don't have an image here, but so that's where your erector pili muscle is. 
uh, glands, about sebaceous glands, right? Your oil producers, sweat glands are in here as well. Um, and then of course you're, you have lymphatics in there as well. So anytime you have tissue that uh, has the potential to accumulate fluid or you need delivery of white blood cells, the lymph vessels have to be there because that's kind of their thing. Okay, and that's, their, that's their two role function. And of course you've got nerve, lots and lots and lots of nerves, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because we already talked about being your primary interacting sp space for your environment, right? It's how you basically interpret your environment is through that sens uh, sensation through your nerves and things. So that's, uh, those are all the different things you got going on in your So there's like a ton of stuff going on in your You think about it, the epidermis is also relatively boring in comparison because all you have is just basically a bunch of keratin filled cells it's just like a little suit of armor, basically. That's what it is. I mean, a cool one, no, no doubt. But it's, I mean, you got all kinds of stuff going on in the dermis. I mean, that's like Grand Central Station for like activity and function, right? So that's where you're really, really, really kind of getting your groove on, so to speak. Um, of course, in the sensory perception, because there's so much sensation going on with the skin, right? All your sensory receptors are going to be loaded into these areas of the skin, right? So, for instance, your pain receptors, your itch receptors, which are actually related. To pain, technically speaking, uh, an itch response is effectively an, a pain response. An itch is a type of pain that your brain interprets a little differently than pain. Uh, your tickle response. No one thought that was a nervous response, but yeah, right, kind of like that light, sort of that light tickle, um, that light touch thing. And then of course your temperature is in there, your touch, uh, both light and heavy touch pressure, right? How many times have you guys said like, well, it doesn't hurt, but I, I can feel the pressure, right? So there's pressure sensors in there um, as well. And then of course, this is the important thing, two point discrimination. Now, what is that? Well, that is what it says it is. It's your ability to discern two different touch points on your skin. Now, in a lot of areas in your body, um, that's, that's basically evidence of the nature of the network of neural sort of wiring underneath the skin itself. The idea is if you've got enough coverage, then you can sense both this point and this point because you've got nerves running through that area. And so if I touch here, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm touching here. If I touch over here, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm touching here, right? So you know that because you got nerves that are kind of interconnecting those areas and your brain can interpret when I'm touching one side versus the other. Okay. Now, when you get down to really, really fine motor, then typically speaking, this is what we're talking about, right? So if I were to use Anthony because he's here, uh, Adam, he does, uh, right? if I were to touch him here on this shoulder, he would know I'm touching him on that shoulder, yes? Now, if I were to touch him over here on this shoulder at the same time, he knows I'm touching him in two different spots, yes? So now, if I squeeze those two touch points in very close together, then the nerves that are kind of covering that start to get into this place where you have space with no sensation. And so at a very small level, I'm actually touching. Can you just feel one touch or two touches? One, right? But I'm actually touching them in two spots. Two tips of my finger. So notice his two point discrimination is broken down. Why? Because there's not a nerve that goes in between those two touches to tell them it's like, oh, well, you're here and here. There's only one that goes through there that says, oh, you're here, right? So what happens then is as you get down to finer and finer neural wiring, then there's more touch points. So I can get very, very fine. Like if I touch him on the fingertip, he can tell I'm touching him in two different places on his fingertip. Why? Because there's a much more intricate wiring in there. That's how we get that little fine motor kind of touch in our fingers. That's that, that, that's correct. Which by the way, is one of the reasons why a lot of people don't like finger sticks is because there's so many nerve endings in your fingertips to shrink that distance between the two points down to a very, very small size. So you can feel a lot of detail in what you're feeling. Okay. So, so that's uh, that's kind of that. So that's kind of gets a little bit of you know because you, you just start moving quickly into the nervous system once you start getting too far down that rabbit hole. So we're going to stay out of the nervous system, um, and we're going to stay in the dermis. So when you take a look at the dermis itself, right, it's not just a single layer. There's actually subdivisions of the dermis, just like you would expect, just like you saw with five subdivisions potentially of uh, the epidermis. You have two major subdivisions of the dermis, 
The first one is what's called the papillary division. This is the piece that's superficial. This is just right underneath, right below the epidermis. And so in this area, you're going to see um, different types of connective tissue. So we're not quite into the dense irregular just yet. Typically, what we're going to see is going to see a little bit of loose fill, right? That's areolar. And we're going to see a lot of elastic fibers. Why? Because you need the flexibility for the elasticity of the skin, right? Skin is notoriously elastic. And so this is what gives you a little bit of that elasticity. So in these areas, it's kind of like a ridge-like structure. So they kind of like form these papilla-like structures like this, which are called dermal papilla. And in this area, basically you have all sorts of things residing. You've got different types of um, touch receptors. For instance, you've got the Meisner, which is light touch receptor, the Pacinian, which is um, deep pressure uh, receptors um, in this particular case, and Ruffini, whoever that is. And then you got a lot of free nerve endings. You got to toss another name in there, right? Uh, by the way, these all have different names, right? So they're not just Meisner, there's other things as well. Pacinian is lamellar, so forth. So there's different names to these as well, not just the people name. But then there's like little nerve endings, like twigs. That infiltrate the dermis, the upper dermis. So you can basically see that you've got a lot of stuff in there that's all nervous in nature. Now, these dermal papilla are important because these guys, when you're laying this down, these sort of undulating waves of connective tissue, they create these whorls and ridges, which sounds like what? Fingerprints, right? Your whorls and ridges are basically the components of your fingerprints. So a whorl, is when you take a look at your thumb, it's kind of like a little looping sort of a thing like that. And then you kind of have these like little ridges and I mean, all these kind of like crazy little things. Now this is all laid down in embryology. That's all created by this papillary layer of the dermis. That's what creates your fingerprints. Now remember the papillary layer is laid down randomly. The connective tissue Lay down randomly in development. What does that mean? That means even though um, me and my brother have similar genetics, we have different fingerprints, right? So there's obviously a genetic component because development is a combination of genetically programmed and well cued events combined with random stochastic events. The random, the cued events, the genetic controlled events are something that we, that we would all share based on the genetics of our parents, right? The random stuff is something that even two identical twins would not share because they just come out randomly. So even though genetically they're doing the same thing, then the lay down of it, it would be random, just like with mold, right? This is the reason why moles are different on twins because those are randomly laid down in development. So you can see you've got a little bit of light treatment of connective tissue, not a lot of thick, harsh stuff. The good stuff comes in the reticular layer. This is deep, this is the deeper one. This is where you get your dense, irregular, collagenous, very collagenous, um, connective tissue. So this is basically the pink swirls, right? If you guys remember your histology, the kind of pink swirly connective tissue that you saw, that's, that's what the dense irregular looks like. A lot of collagen in there, a lot of elasticity. You're always gonna have elastin in this particular tissue because of the flexibility requirements of skin, that elasticity that you need for skin. So you're always gonna have those elastic fibers in there as well. Um, and so, this is basically where you'll have a lot of those deeper structures of the dermis originating. For instance, your hair follicles will originate deep into the dermis, into the reticular layer. Some, a lot of your nerves will be originating 
from that area as well. It's like the Pacinian, for instance, oftentimes can be found in the reticular uh, end of the dermis rather than being riding up high in the papillary layer. Um, the oil glands, sebaceous glands, which are typically associated with the follicles because you're lubricating your hair, that's your, kind of your natural conditioner. Um, that's basically going to be associated with the deeper area of the, the dermis. Your sweat glands as well are going to be originating in this particular area in the reticular, the deeper layer of the dermis as well. And then delivering the sweat is by a duct. So you have a duct that goes through the reticular layer, up through the papillary layer, through the epidermis, and then empties, opens up into the outside of the skin. So you can actually secrete your sweat on the surface of your skin. So those are all a part of that. Your heat sensors, right? So your ability to sense uh, hot and cold, those sorts of things, those are all deep in the dermis. So there's a lot going on in your dermis and especially that reticular layer of your dermis, there's a lot going on. So the other thing that you see in your epidermis and your dermal, uh, dermis, not your epidermis, your dermis, <clears throat> because the papillary layer as it's laid down is laying down these ridges and whorls, which are your fingerprints, right? And that's kind of very individual to you because we all go through a slightly different set of experiences embryologically. That's why we're different. The same idea of laying down the dermal ridges in specific patterns gets to this idea of cleavage lines. And if you've ever been in a surge tech class, one of the things you learn about in all these is cleavage lines, right? And the reason why you learn about cleavage lines is because when you lay down these little layers of dermis, it's, it's like you're being laid down as sort of like, you know, strands of a fabric, if you will, like a toga, right? Like you can throw a drape a toga and like across your chest, you could drape it straight down. I mean, you can do all kinds of things with it. You can go all the way down, you can wrap it around like a scarf. I mean, so there's a lot of different directionality you can take. Same thing's happening with this dermis as you're laying this down, it creates these sort of directional longitudinal lines of symmetry in your body that we refer to as cleavage lines. The reason why we call them cleavage lines is because of the way that it's laid down in development. So for instance, your cleavage lines will run parallel oftentimes to each other in various directions, depending on how it's laid down. Now, the reason why this is important is because when you're doing surgery, you want to make an incision that is along that goes along with or is in parallel with the cleavage lines. Why? Because this will help you to heal faster. Um, it'll keep the suture closed, right? And you'll it'll be less visible. So it'll be less scarring involved in there. Now, if you cut across, which sometimes you have to do, you do, I mean there's just Sometimes you have to do it. It depends on how you want to need to get about it. But if you go perpendicular to it, then what's happening is these cleavage tension lines are actually pulling the suture apart. So that's going to leave more gapping in between the suture itself, which is going to lead to a more greater likelihood of scarring. Okay, so now if you're a surgeon and your goal is to minimize scarring, then you try to go with the cleavage lines as much as possible. Now, is this uh, all that important if you're trying to do an emergency appendectomy? Perhaps, right? But let's face it. I mean, if you're an abdominal surgeon, you're worried about keeping the patient alive. So if you have to go across the cleavage lines, so be it. So you have an ugly scar. Consider it a battle mark, right? A badge of honor. That's your purple heart for life, right? So that's like you're, you're welcome to being alive here's your purple heart, it's a scar, right? Um, so that's what they're interested in. Now, who really gets their geek off on this one? The cosmetic people, right? So like if you're having to do some sort of a surgery, abdominal surgery, and you're like a swimsuit model, and so you have a lot at stake in terms of making sure that you don't have this hideous looking scar because nobody's gonna want to look at you, and that means you're not gonna get a job, then oftentimes a cosmetic surgeon will try to play these little games to see if they can, you know, make sure that these scars are invisible. And actually that's a lot, a lot of cosmetic surgeons do is to say, how can I change the way you look without it being obvious that I change the way you look, right? 
So then the problem is that never works, right? Because we already know what you're supposed to look like. And the fact like this <laughs> is not normal, right? You're like, okay, wait a minute. How old are you? You shouldn't look like that, right? You didn't even look like that when you were 20, right? So you look like some sort of a cat. <laughs> Something I worked on in AMP. <laughs> right. So that's kind of um that's kind of that's kind of what you have. Um like with search tech, they they can you kind of do this a lot. Okay, let's keep going. Yes, right? Hypodermis basically. Hypo below the dermis. Skin. So remember the dermis, the connective tissue, is the biggest part of the three-layered system of the skin, the integument. Not only that, but the dermis is actually what we refer to as skin proper, right? Which is the reason why we say there's the dermis, the skin, and then there's the epidermis up on the skin, and then there's the hypodermis below the skin. So when you, like, I think I told you this guy before, right? So when you tan leather, the leather is the dermis. That's the connective tissue. So that's the skin proper, okay? And, then, and you can see that because there's so much stuff going on in there. Now, what about the hypodermis? Well, the hypodermis doesn't really do a whole lot of use. Uh, I mean, what are you going to find in here? You're going to find fibroblasts in there, sure, right? Because you need to have them in there so that you can reconstruct the tissue when it does get damaged, because that's also going to get damaged if you cut yourself. Um, a lot of adipose cells, right? This is your subcutaneous fat. This is where most of your fat reserves are. Um, and not only that, but typically speaking, um, uh, generally, generally, when you look at adipose cells, this region um, tends to grow. You tend not to add or accumulate more adipose cells. So they tend not to divide. You tend to fill them up more, right? So you kind of, they make, you make the adipose cells that you have there fatter, right? Which is, generally speaking, your body doesn't replace them. Right, so you don't like increase your fat cells. You increase the amount of fat in your fat cells. That's what makes the fat reserves, which is the reason why things like liposuction are not a good idea because you're actually physically removing the structure of the adipocytes and your body is already has a tendency to not build more, which pretty much means that's gonna limit your ability to store fat. Now that may be what you're going for with the liposuction, but that can actually be quite dangerous, right? Because if you limit your body's ability to actually do a fundamental biological process, you generally pay for it. Um, and it's not a good payment, okay? It's much better to try to lose weight like the way that your body wants to, not to turn yourself into um, a fat reduced Cheshire cat. You guys know what I'm talking about because you've seen pictures of a lot of cats. They, there's a lot of there's a lot of bipedal cats walking around Hollywood, right? We see this. Did you look at it? It's like, uh, no, that didn't work for me, right? I know what you did. I know what you're going for, but that didn't work for me, right? Because all you can see now is like, like the train wreck. That's all you can see. It's like you're just like looking at like a freak show. It's like. Not like, oh, hey, you look great. No, you don't ever look great. You look obvious, right? Because nobody's that stupid. We've been around the block enough times to know that somebody in their 60s shouldn't look like that. It's just not possible. I mean, there, there's a rare, rare, it is possible, but the, the number of them is so rare that, yeah, it wasn't you because I remember what you looked like before you went in. And it's like, you know, you just kind of like take all the boots and you just kind of tie it up, right? Like Grandpa Simpson, everybody like this, I love that one. That was hilarious. Some of you guys might know that episode that I'm talking about. Yeah, it's like, I think it was neck skin or something like that. It's like, it's all like that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and he's like, <laughs> like, okay. That's just, that's just wrong. Just go with what you are, right? Um, and it's, it's, oh, it just cracks me up because I'm all like, what do you think you're going to do? You think you're going to like be a stud to like the 20 year olds? You're never, I mean, if you're in their 60s, 
let it go. The 20 year olds are out of reach. I'm sorry. And they should be right. <laughs> because I mean, so I don't know who you're trying to like, you know, um, impress because the other 60 year olds already know. And those who are us who are 40 already know. So the only ones, I mean, it's like, and the 20 year olds are like, um, yeah, whatever, weirdo, right? So I'm out. Um, so I, that's, I never did understand that. It's like, wh who are you doing this for and why are you doing this? Because everybody knows already. You can see I have a lot of issues with cosmetics, the entire field of cosmetics. Um, yes, they do make a lot of money. That just goes to show you how, how powerful our insecurities are with growing older, which is one of the reasons why there's, uh, uh, there's I mean, there's a lot to be said for um, the attractiveness of somebody who is centered and stable and like completely okay with their stage in life. Like as you're getting older, it's like, yeah, you're starting to look like a little wrinkly bag of, of leather, but man, it's like, there's just something that's like an old wine. That's like, you know, it's like, there's something that's just cool about that, you know? Um, you, guys, uh, you guys are like, no, it's not cool. Yeah. Until of course you get to the point in age where it's obvious that your skull is sliding off your face. I mean, your face is sliding off your skull, which is true, right? Because you get the bloody eyed look, right? And you can't help it because that's your face sliding off your skull. I mean, obviously we start to get to that point. You're like, okay, you're, you're just there. I mean, you're just, yeah, you're just, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, I know, right? It's like, you guys are brutal. So, so I, I can see, I've got maybe, I've got maybe, so from that, see how brutal the crowd is. I'm thinking I've got maybe 10 years left. And then you guys are going to be ready for euthanasia. It's like, instead of doing teacher evaluations, let's actually just make him the first participant in the cadaver lab. <laughs> I know, right? So, um, so that's your hypodermis, right? So it's important though, obviously, right? Because this is your energy source. This is your energy reserves, right? We already talked a little bit about that. It's also your insulation, right? It does provide, we already know this from other mammals who beef up during the winter. And it works really well, right? So it's a really great insulator. And then of course, padding. <laughs> I love that one, padding. Um, so what does that mean? That means if you take somebody with a six pack and you jam a battering ram into their six pack versus somebody who's got a little bit of Santa going on there, who do you think you're gonna hurt more? The six pack, because you are literally bashing right into that musculature, which means you're immediately doing damage to some important tissues. Santa, beat away. I mean, you're not touching anything. I mean, you're not getting anywhere close, right? Those abdominal muscles have long since given up. I mean, they're like, you know, we're not needed anymore. So it's like, like I mean, it's gone, right? So you're not doing any damage to them, right? So that's what we mean by padding. So it's just remember that when you go with body blows, right? Body blows only work if you've got muscle to hit, right? If you're like, uh, who was it that was kind of a little chubby? As a, was that George Foreman? He had a little bit of, bit of a gut. When he came back the first time, not the, not the first time, the second time, when he came back and, and he won the World Heavyweight Championship, that's before he started making all of his grills, his Foreman grills. But he had kind of a, he was a big, he's a chubby dude, big. But he's kind of chubby, so it's like you don't want to body blow George Foreman because he's got a little more padding there. You want to save those body blows for somebody who's like chiseled, right? Like those MMA fighters. It's like, oh yeah, thank you very much for removing all your padding because I'm got your my body blow. I mean, they're gonna hurt. They're gonna hurt bad, right? That's the reason why body blows are so effective on these well-trained athletes is because you're doing more damage. There's no padding there to absorb that blow. Um, So it reminds me of another scene from The Simpsons um, when they were doing like a health exam on Homer and they started jiggling his stomach and it was just like jiggling and jiggling and jiggling and they're all just watching him like, it's mesmerizing. <laughs> like, yeah, all that padding, Homer. 
so many life lessons coming from the Simpsons. Um, okay, so this is also the region of your injection, right? So when you have different types of injections, then you're going for different regions of your integument system. For instance, if you're going intra within the dermis, you're going shallow. You're going usually up there in that papillary layer of the dermis. So it's just kind of like, this is a, like the TB test, right? Have you guys ever had that TB test? Right, so like a little bit of a prick. It just kind of pricks the skin, gets underneath the epidermis into that upper layer of the dermis. That's like a TB test, right? So that's an intradermal. Your subcutaneous is you're getting below the dermis. <coughs> this is also hypodermic. That's also another term for the subcutaneous injection is hypodermic. So you're getting down there in that hypodermal fat region. So that's your hypodermal injection. Um, and then intramuscular. I mean, how many of you guys had your COVID vaccination? And you paid attention to the mode of vaccination. So in your records, it'll tell you what the, what the uh, agent was, that it was an RNA injection, and that it was either hypodermal, intradermal, or intramuscular. How many of you guys picked up that, that these were intramuscular? Right? That's what this is. So what that means is when you're getting it in your arm, they're going through the dermis, through the hypodermis, into the deltoid muscle, which is the reason why there is so much post-injection recovery issues associated with the vaccinations is because you're essentially doing harm to the muscle, and that creates bruising at times and pain because of the pain receptors that are in there and things of that nature. So, But you're getting that, that uh, viral RNA into that intramuscular region so that you can get an immune response to and develop antibodies to it. Uh, it depends on how you need it to uh, be trans transmitted. So for instance, for the TB, all you need is to see whether or not you get a, an immune reaction. That's all it is. And you can do that at the shallowest most point at that particular entry point in the papillary layer because you're just looking for like an immunity reaction. Um, for the subcutaneous or the hypodermic, generally speaking, because you've got down at that level, you've got all of these blood vessels in that region and you've got your lymphatics down there. So if you inject some sort of, um, it, whether it's antibodies or there's different types of, of mechanisms, but whatever that is, if you inject that down in that region, it's going to be picked up by the vasculature because the vasculature is down there in space. That's where the bulk of your vasculature is. What's up in the dermis are smaller arterioles, right? But what's down in the hypodermis is the larger arterioles and also the lymphatics. So the lymphatics are also down in there as well. And so they will suck up and mop up any fluid that's in there, including what you just injected. And that'll get it into circulation. Okay, so you're going for circulation. That's the reason why the majority of our injections are subcutaneous or hypodermis nature is because we're just trying to get it into circulation so that your body can see it react to it. Now an intramuscular, um, typically what you want to do because, and this is unusual intramusculars are, but with the intramuscular one, what you're trying to do is you're trying to avoid circulation, but you're trying to elicit a, a bit of a response. So Part of the problem with getting into circulation, especially with like an immune system, is your immune system will basically mount an attack. Now, for the, it's like the COVID booster, which was an intramuscular RNA injection, what happens is RNA is single-stranded. And to every cell in your body, whenever they see single-stranded nucleic acids, they think viral invasion because our, our genome is double-stranded. DNA is double-stranded but most viral genomes are single-stranded. So when your cells see single-stranded nucleic acids, they immediately think viral invasion, let's kill and tear it apart. And that's what they do. They take the RNA, they rip it apart, they dismantle it, and then they destroy it. The problem is if you're trying to get a response from this, it doesn't help you for your immune system to get sick on the RNA and destroy it before you've actually had a chance to make whatever it is from it. That makes sense? Yeah. So that's the reason why they do intramuscular because you're avoiding more of those enzymes that are designed to destroy single-stranded RNA. 
And that gives the RNA a chance to make whatever protein it is. It's usually like a, a capsule protein or something like that. And then your immune system can attack that. Um, and then and then go after that and treat that as like, oh, okay, here's the bad guy, right? So that's kind of what it's designed to do. So it's a slightly different mechanism in that sense. Okay, so what about the accessory structures? Let's take a look at some of these guys, hair, right? Let's go for the hair first of all. Uh, so hair basically um, originates deep into the dermis, so in that reticular layer. And so you can see there's lots of different parts too. And we're gonna take a look at each of the individual parts. But first of all, We'll take a look at kind of where that start, where that kind of coverage. We're already, I mean, we're adults. We know where the hair is and where it's not, right? So that's, those are, those are sorts of things. Now it's helpful to understand also um, that we're mammals and unlike most mammals, we're fairly hairless. I mean, we don't have a whole lot of hair on us actually compared to most mammals. I think you're a dog. I mean, they're covered in hair, right? Most mammals are, uh, and, but we're not. Right, so the only areas where, unlike mammals, that we are not covered in hair for the most part is palms, soles, lips, things like that. Um, right, so genitalia, some of the areas of the genitalia are not covered. Um, fingers and toes, for instance, those are some areas that are not covered with hair. Most areas of our body have some sort of hair associated with it. That doesn't necessarily mean that we got the woolly, you know, the woolly mammoth thing going on. Some of us do. <laughs> Uh, some of us don't, right? But you have the potential for hair developments across the body, but it's quite variable, okay? Um, now, obviously, when we take a look at uh, the hair pieces, we, hair pieces, no pun intended, but if we take a look at the hair part of it, there's different types of hair. So not all hair is the same, right? There's different types of things. The structure is very similar, but the actual nature of the hair is different. Okay. So for instance, when you take a look at a fetus, right, there's like a little bit of like goose down, like little baby fuzz on the baby, uh, like right when they're born, they lose it pretty quickly, by the way. So you have to look really cool, carefully. Um, but that's called lanugo. So that's basically like a little itty bit of hair that's on them, just like a little bit of peach fuzz that's on them that gets, that disappears quickly and then slowly gets replaced with um, the full normal hair if that's, if that's in an area. So some of you guys who like, who got the little baby thing, you've seen, you've seen know what I'm talking about, right? There's that like little baby fuzz on there, right? And, but it disappears pretty quickly within a few months, right? Because then like, even if, you're, even if you're a baby and you have hair coming out, usually you'll lose that in about six months or so, and then it grows back. So the, the full hair comes back, right? So it's, there's this kind of transition that's going on there. Um, then you have what's called terminal hair. So this is the hair hair, right? This is the hair that we think of the hair, right? The stuff that we make all these products for, uh, the hair, the terminal hair, right? This is the coarser stuff, the heavier stock stuff. This is our fur coat, right? This is what we see on our scalp. Um, this is our eyebrows um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the areas that are covered, okay? So the axillary hair, your armpit hair basically, right? pubic hair, um, all this sort of stuff, um, facial hair, this is all your terminal hair. But you also know that there's differences there, right? Like pubic hair, for instance, is a lot coarser than scalp hair. And not enough, but scalp hair can actually change a lot of times, right? So uh, a lot of us kind of uh, will go through stages in life where our hair is a little coarser and thicker, but then it kind of gets a little finer at times, right? So you can see there's a lot of dynamic variation in your fur coat as you go through different stages in life. And that's a very common thing. This is the reason why hair is a really fascinating sort of a thing is because it's so consequential across all mammals. I mean, for mammals, it's their life strategy. I mean, it's like, this is how they save themselves. Like the snowshoe hair, for instance. I mean, it's fur coat is what keeps it alive, right? Um, for us, it's not so much keeps us alive, but it certainly does determine whether or not we actually replace the next generation, right? For us, our fur coat is largely wrapped in not necessarily to natural selection as much as it is into sexual selection, right? I mean, think about it. I mean, how many of you guys have a type, right? And that type usually goes into like hair color, eye color, right? 
And so you have a definite preference. It's like, you know what? I like this over here, not this over here. And if you take a look at that, a lot of that has to do with hair, right? And so that's because of, I mean, that's so it's consequential. So in a lot of ways, our reproductive patterns in part, not totally, are driven by our hair. Wow. So you are here because of somebody's hair. <laughs> okay, that's crazy. But anyway, there it is. Um, but you know, it's true, right? Because we can all feel it in our own attraction, can't we? Right? I mean, how many of you guys have been like, okay, that particular hairstyle was like, wow. Right? And then somebody, the same person changes the hairstyle drastically, like, woof. Right? <laughs> right? So what happened there? That was a sexual selection thing. Was that the same person? Yes. All that happened was hair change, right? So hair is a big deal for all of you cosmetic beauty people who want to go into hair. I right now I get some of those. Um, then along with the terminal hair, we had what's called vellus hair. So this is kind of like the finer hair, the shorter hair. Um, that's kind of like on your arms, right? This is like arm hair. Right, leg hair, for instance. So the finer stuff. But a lot of, I mean, we don't really care about that one, do we? I mean, we're not, I mean, well, sometimes we do, right? I mean, if we want to shave legs or something like that or, or armpits or whatever, I mean, that's, I mean, so in some cases it does, but I mean, generally speaking, you know, it's terminal hair that's, that's powering match.com. But anyway, um, so let's take a look at the structure of the actual hair itself. And so basically we're going to start off with defining some terms. First of all, the shaft is, and this is the key, we refer to the shaft as the part that's above the skin. So where you see it, what you see is the shaft of the hair, mostly made of keratin. The root is basically the part that is below the skin. And then the bulb or the hair bulb is the base of this root. Okay, so where are that? Shaft above the skin, Root below the skin, the bulb is the very bottom rounded part of the hair shaft itself, the hair bulb. So typically speaking, when you take a look at the overall structure of the hair, you have three distinct layers. The medulla, which is the central portion, is going to be found, well, in the central portion, right? So the medulla is always going to be like this little blue circle right there. Now, around that is going to be the, the cortex, which is the majority of the hair. Um, and that's going to be this um, um, purple region here. So that's your cortex. I'm going to put a C there. I put an M in the middle. Hopefully you guys can see that. So you have medulla in the center, cortex around it. And then around the cortex is going to be your cuticle. So this is basically going to be the surface of the hair, which is going to be this little brown area. So I'm going to say cortex CO versus CU. Cuticle is going to be this little round, brown part. Okay. So um, ultimately, then, when you're taking a look at this, what you mostly see outside is the cuticle at the base, right? But then mostly you see the cortex and the medulla. That's mostly what your hair is made out of. Okay. Dead cell keratin stuff. Now, inside the bulb, uh, you're going to kind of exp expand some things. So, this is kind of like um, the three main layers up here that you associate with the shaft. But then, as you go into it and get into the bulb itself, then you're going to start to see some living layers. of the hair itself. So what are these, um, these pieces? Well, you have what's called an internal matrix. And we're going to talk a little bit about this here once we actually get to this bulb piece, but we don't really have a good uh, view of it here just yet. But you're going to get to the internal matrix. So this is like the mitotic zone. Remember, your hair grows, yes? Which means you have to possibly replace those because your hair also gets cut off, right? So that means you have to replace those cells all the time. That means you have some sort of a mitotic core at your growth point, right? So at the bulb, and this mitotic core is the matrix. So this is where 
that uh, those new cells are being added to your hair itself. Um, and then ultimately the, um, the root papilla is basically where the dermis kind of folds up in. So it kind of folds up into the root itself and kind of creates the vasculature and things like that. So we'll take a look at this here in just a second. But let me kind of fill out this little ring here because we got about as far as the cuticle. Now, as you start to go outside the cuticle, you have other layers associated with it. For instance, this big yellow layer, which is our next layer out, this is, there's, there's gonna be two different, what's called root. Typically they are uh, cells of varying stripes, um, epithelial cells. <clears throat> and the, the first one is the internal epithelial root sheath. So you can see this yellow piece. So it's an internal layer of epithelial cells that kind of ensheathes the root. Okay, and then you have an external epithelial root sheet. So another layer. So you have two different layers of epithelial sheathing that covers this cuticle cortex medulla core. Okay, and then on the outside of that, you have your connective tissue piece of it, which is all connective tissue. And this basically adds to, and this is really why they call it the dermal root sheath. So this is basically gonna be connecting to the dermis connective tissue. So you have the interweaving of the connective tissues with, uh, between this connective tissue root sheath and the dermis, the connective tissue of the dermis. So that's how your actual root bulb is inserted into the dermis. It's basically weave the connective tissue together into the dermal connective tissue. And by the way, that's one thing that I always want you to keep very front and center in your mind. One of the key things, remember, and I think I mentioned this before in the previous chapter, but I mentioned it again because you never want to get too far away from it, is remember that when you are taking two different types of connective tissue and you want to connect them together, it's very easy to do that. All you have to do is create connective tissue for each of them. Those collagenous fibers can be woven together between those two connective tissues and create a linkage of those two, those two structures. Here's a good example, right? When you're taking a look at a tendon, the way that a tendon is attached to the uh, bone is by using this exact strategy, right? We already know that the tendon is mostly collagenous fibers that are laid down, right? Well, as it turns out, the outer layer of the bone, it's got, the, it's got an outer liner called the periosteum, and we'll talk about that in chapter six, the next chapter. But there's two layers of periosteum. There's a cellular layer that's close to the bony matrix. And then there is a connective tissue layer that's kind of facing toward the outside. And this connective tissue layer has lots of collagenous fibers in it. And this is where the collagen of the tendon interweaves with the collagen of the periosteum and basically kind of gets woven into the bone liner. So your tendons are literally woven into the periosteal connective tissue of the bone. So you don't just like like a stick and a stamp on it and just glue it to the bone. You actually weave the collagenous fibers of the tendon with the collagenous fibers of the bone together so that it's actually a woven system. And that's because you've got connective tissue to connective tissue. That's true wherever you are in the body for whatever the application is in the body. So if you want to embed a structure into an otherwise connective tissue matrix, all you have to do is put a little connective tissue around it and interweave these fibers into each other. Okay. So that is a common strategy. That's how your blood vessels are embedded in your tissues because their outer layer of a blood vessel is, is collagenous connective tissue and it interweaves with your surrounding connective tissue so that your blood vessels are stable and in place. They're not just wobbling and flopping around all over the place. Everything in your body is anchored that way. And that's a common strategy. You'll see like a functional inner portion, like the cellular layer of the periosteum, followed by a connective tissue structural outer layer, which is designed to interweave with surrounding connective tissue and anchor everything in place. That's a very, very common strategy to see throughout all of AMP. Okay, This is the first example of it. So basically this um, dermal root sheath then is gonna be part of the dermis and it's gonna be surrounding your epithelial sheath. So here you can see, here's our circle view. If you send it, take a look at it on the side view. So here you can see you've got your medulla here, followed by your cortex, your brown cuticle there. 
your internal root sheath, which is the sh uh, shallower, narrower um, yellow section, and your external root sheath, which is the thicker pink section. So those are your two root sheaths. And then you can see the papilla, right? The hair papilla, where you can see the dermal tissue kind of oozes into it and creates this sort of flame-like structure. And this flame-like structure, <clears throat> if you take a look at it, is basically going to be like the uh, the stratum basal. So this is your mitotic layer. So you can see it's like a stratum basal here, this little mitotic layer right here is gonna be your stratum basal. And that's gonna be the one that's gonna be making all those new cells. And all those new cells are gonna be treadmilling in this direction, the direction of the growth of your hair. So you'll have some medullary cells, you'll have some um, cortical cells, some cuticle cells, and then you'll also have some epithelial cells, some root sheath cells, okay? Notice what you also have in here, melanocytes, these little green guys in there. Those are melanocytes. So as, just like with your skin, right? As you're laying down new hair cells, your melanocytes are laying down pigment in those hair cells. So as those cells move forward, you have the hair cells associated with the genetics of your pigmentation. So this is where your dark hair, brown hair, all that comes from. And that's the reason why your, your hair is pigmented. But also notice though in this area, you also have your hair papilla, which is the vasculature. This is your vascular supply to the mitotic cells. Um, wait a minute, I just had a little brain explosion. Okay, sorry. Yes, I know what I was thinking. Gotta hit the record button because the whole last uh, hour has been a waste of time. But anyway, right, so, so that's kind of what you've got. So essentially what you have then is well-fed mitotic cells that are constantly adding new cells to the matrix and you get basically this maturation treadmilling effect heading upward through the hair shaft up to the, up to the skin basically, where it'll pop out. Now this whole region right in here, this, is this, this zone right in here, this is the matrix. That's your growth zone, including your mitotic layer. So that's the, that's the zone of living cells. Cells are growing. They're mostly alive. And then eventually, obviously, at some point, the cells die, right? How do you know your hair cells are dead? No, you know they're dead because you're not screaming in pain every time you get a haircut, which is what would happen if your hair cells were still alive, right? So they're all dead because you can just basically cut all your hair off and it's like, whatever, right? Which is probably what I'm gonna do here in about a week or two because I'm getting sick of myself. But anyway, um, right now my annoyance level is starting to increase over my just general laziness level. So, which is always kind of funny because every now and then like, I'll kind of come in a little woolly and students are like, oh, you're growing a beard? Like, no, I'm just lazy. I never do any of that, that stuff intentionally. It's just pure laziness. So, so I get tired of shaving. It's just like that's how you come in with sort of whatever. So, or like in this case, I can't stand going and having my hair cut. Just, that's one of the things I hate the absolute most. So I do it only like maybe twice a year. That's it. And every single time I do it, I, seri I get closer and closer to just shaving my head. So I'm all like, you know what? I can end this. I can end this. So, unfortunately, I probably will not be welcome at home. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, no. But so, if I come in bald one of these days, you'll know finally I crossed to the dark side. And you guys are probably like, dude, don't do that again. I'm like, okay. Yeah, no, right? Yeah, this is the backyard. The dogs are on the bed, I'm in the backyard. Um, <laughs> okay, so how does hair growth work? 
right? So obviously it's a staged situation and it's cyclic in nature. So the growth stage, you add your cells at the base, right? So basically just like through your stratum basal, just like you do with your epidermis, same basic process. It's a treadmilling effect. <clears throat> So then ultimately, this is your growth stage. It's an easy one. But your resting stage, this is kind of a little different, right? Because we don't have a resting stage for skin, so to speak. But this is kind of like a resting stage, right? So oftentimes what will happen is your follicle will kind of go through sometimes like a natural sort of a progression where it'll actually fall out. Uh, the first thing it does is it shortens, right? And then it's kind of hanging out there and sort of just sort of hanging out in the follicle. It's not really in its active growth phase. But then sometimes what will happen is the follicle, the hair will actually fall out of the follicle itself. Um, and then what will happen is you'll start the process of a new one, beginning with your growth phase. That is the mitotic piece of it, right? So you kind of have varying sort of ebbs and flows of this. Um, and so this is very dynamic, right? There's, there's a lot, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of difference associated with this. Um, so depending on where you are, your stage of, 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 uh, of life that you're at, you can basically be in different stages of this. So active growth phase versus active resting stage. Um, by the way, we are, we know that this resting stage is a thing, don't we? Because how many of you guys have sort of encountered like the shedding phenomenon? Not your dog, right? But it's not like you're like pulling your hair out. It's just like you naturally, it's like your hair comes out. Like if you're brushing your hair, like if you have long hair, I mean, I'm looking at obviously uh, you, Renee, because you, you, you guys have long hair and also you, Bex, as well. So, right, because you guys have long hair, right? So if you're brushing your hair, what naturally happens? It's like you take a look at the brush and it's like, okay, there's a ton of hair in there, right? But that's not because you're literally ripping your hair out of your head. It's just that natural exfoliation that's going on, that natural shedding process, which is associated with the resting stage, that sort of alternates between the different cycles for different periods of time. By the way, there's nothing new there, right? Mammals do this all the time, don't they? Right, in the winter, they get their winter coat, their thick, heavily growth state winter coat to keep them nice and warm. And then when they enter spring, then they go through a heavy shedding period, right? Where they're shedding everywhere. And so they're losing that winter coat and they're getting themselves down to kind of a leaner, meaner level. And so that well, we're shedding naturally, that's, that's just this oscillation between the growth and the resting stage, right? So that's kind of a normal thing. And so, like you said, I mean, different things will cause this um, and there'll be a lot of dynamic nature to this, right? So, um, so if you're losing a lot of hair, then that means it's hopefully gonna be replaced, right? And that's normal, right? You lose hair and, and you get replaced. And the reason why I mentioned uh, folks with long hair and especially women and Nate in general is because generally speaking, they're constantly shedding all the time, right? Because you can see that in their brushes. Uh, guys, it's not as big a deal because largely, I mean, the, sh the hair is generally not always shorter. And so it's, you don't really see the shedding, even although guys are doing it as well. Um, but what happens is the oftentimes, especially in a, a woman with long hair, it's like you can see the act of shedding in the brush, but it's like the hair doesn't disappear. It's like not you're not like going bald, right? It's being replaced. And that's kind of this constant sort of shedding, replacement, shedding, replacement, shedding, replacement. That's what we're talking about here. Of course, in guys, it's a little bit different for us, right? Um, because male pattern baldness is an X-linked gene, which means it predominantly hits males and they get it from their maternal line, which is the reason why you say, well, if you want to know whether or not you're going to go bald, look at your mother's father, right? And that's because it's X-linked. So because from your dad, you got his Y chromosome and pattern baldness is X-linked in nature. So you got it from mom, blame her. Right. So um, that's <laughs> right. So that's kind of where, where that is. And so this is permanent. Right. So this is a situation where you're shedding, but you're not getting that growth phase kicked back in. Right. That's kind of where that's a problem. And there's various reasons for that. But remember, 
Remember we talked about age-related deterioration over time, or we got ourselves good and depressed about that one at the end of the last chapter. But this is part of that, right? So part of the reason why a lot of times baldness, especially in men, occurs more frequently <laughs> with age is partly because of the overall systemic deterioration of these processes just due to age. And part of that systemic deterioration process associates associated with this growth stage of hair development. Okay? So the idea is that men, generally most men, will get experience some sort of baldness phenomenon, either just uh, you know, hairline recession or something of that nature, right? I mean, most men will, even if they're technically not bald, they're certainly thinner, right? as they get older and part of it is because of the fact that the shedding process is continuing but the growth that replaces it is slowing down or not as efficient as it was back when they were in their 20s now pattern baldness is genetic right so this is it, this is above and beyond the already associated age-related deterioration of growth of hair growth right um, this is like something that this is the re this this is what you're getting when you're getting say for instance, you know like already very striking um, balding patterns in somebody who's like in their twenties, right? That's what we're talking about there. Okay, that's definitely an abnormal level of balding, and that's a genetic thing. That's where you start to blame mom. Okay, um, and so you know if you're kind of in your thirties, forties, and you're starting to see some thinness. That's a little on the aggressive side of normal. If you're in your 50s and 60s, you should expect to see some thinness. That's actually a very normal. And if you're in your 70s and 80s and you're not seeing any thinness, that's pretty abnormal, right? So, I mean, it's just, that's just because it's an age-related progression, right? Just remember that, you know, when you're looking at your significant others and they happen to be males, right? That's what you have to look at, like, in, when you're in your 70s, right? Like, what happened to your hair? It's like, what happened to my collagen? It's like my connective tissue. It's all gone. It's like all of it, right? What happened to my face, right? It's like, well, it's kind of sagging below the chin line now. Um, that's, that's just, that's the reason why I always say it's like, AMP will, will rudely awaken you quickly. Um, because I always tell people, it's like, you know, the hysterical thing about cosmetic surgery is if you've been on this planet for seven decades, nobody looks good. Nobody. Nobody. Nope. Okay, just, no, okay, the fact that the fact that you were struggling with decent means that nobody looks good. <laughs> that is true. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? But you're like, hey, I'm just saying, gravity, seven decades of gravity will have its toll. So, you know, you can, because you can see it in nursing homes. Because it's like you always kind of go into nursing homes. You can see the age on their face. You can see, and some you're right. Some do look good, but you can see it's still there. But, but you can see it's like you know, wow. Like back in the day, you were like, wow, right? But it's like now it's like, wow. Okay, my face is falling off of my skull, and you can't stop it because it's gravity, right? Welcome to planet Earth. It's actually worse everywhere else. This is about as good as it gets, right? So that's the reason why I always tell people, it's like, if you marry, uh, don't marry just for looks because that is the stupidest reason to marry for. I mean, because all of that turns into tragedy. I mean, it is. Well, okay. So granted, you don't want to be repulsed by the person. So that's, <laughs> but let's, let's put it this way. The 20 year old newlyweds, if they fast forward themselves to when they were 80, would probably be like, what the hell? 
<laughs> am I waking up next to? No, right? I'm just saying. That's, well, that's the thing though, right? Because it's mutual. So, you know, but that, that's, the, that's the one mercy is like, you know, you don't get there overnight. You kind of grow into it. So you're both hopefully looking just as bad. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? I'm just a ball of sunshine today, aren't I? So there I am. So yeah, <laughs> you, got, I don't know. Denise is all like, "This dude should not be a marriage counselor." But anyway, um, <laughs> I know, right? Well, that's why I'm an AMP person. That's just brutal. Re that's just brutal reality with AMP. I mean, we are basically deteriorating as we stand. So, so, yeah. so was that a question, Bex? I just okay, it's just right. Okay, so a couple of variances to this, right? Alopecia. Um, so this, there can be like different types. Alopecia is just generally is a general term. It's just hairlessness essentially, right? Um, so like if you have like spots of baldness on there, and sometimes we say like you'll see somebody with like a little bald spot on their hair. Oftentimes these are like just like random events that are happening in their skin that are associated a lot of times associated with autoimmune disorders um, in that particular area where there's an aggressive piece. Now, if you're talking about global alopecia, there is a more systemic type of alopecia where it kind of affects everywhere in the body. So you're talking about people who have no hair, like they have no eyebrows, you know, nothing um, of that nature. That's a kind of a, that's more of a systemic level of alopecia that's kind of attacking the entire body itself. Uh, Jada Pinkett Smith is a good example of somebody who suffers from the, the, um, yeah. Well, she has alopecia. That's what she's been diagnosed with. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she burned her hair off. But that's what she's been diagnosed with. Which, by the way, if you're wondering, which was the whole flap over the whole Will Smith, Chris Rock thing was because he basically the idea was Chris Rock was making fun of somebody who has an actual medical diagnosis. It's like if I were to laugh at you for having diabetes, that would be wrong. Right. That's essentially the reason why Chris Rock got his face smashed. Yeah. Oh, so. <laughs> yes, he was. Yes, he so was. He was. <laughs> yeah. You can tell that from his speech when he was, he was acting like Sir Richard. He was talking. Yeah, he was talking like Richard. Yeah. That's what's happening. That's the problem with the method, with method character, with method acting, is you kind of go down the rabbit hole. You do a great job of the role, but you have to be able to get back out. And yeah, definitely, I totally agree with you because you could totally hear it in the speech. He was still playing Richard. He was still acting like Richard. He was, he hadn't detoxed yet. So, which is unfortunate, but because it ruined his career. I mean, in some ways. So. So that's, a, whoa, I'm way over time. I'm getting all excited here. You guys are just like, let me ramble on. Fuck it. You guys are like, well, technically, you guys are like, well, technically, live doesn't start for four minutes. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, you guys are all now depressed, right? You got your, so, okay. So we'll start off with hair color and muscles next time. I think I've got an age slide on this one. So you're probably you're anticipating that one.